right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeline or CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from the other coast, from Northern Virginia, from Lori Sites. How are you doing, Lori? I'm doing well, thanks, John. Absolutely. Lori is leading authority on improving productivity and engagement through workplace well-being, the founder of Zen Le of the Zen Leadership Program for Results-Focused Professionals, com uh, a comprehensive background in wellness and communication strategy. Lori helps executives create focused, resilient, and collaborative teams that can move uh, projects forward to less stress and drama. And you have your own podcast, too, called Fine is a Four-Letter Word. And, uh, and what we're going to talk about today is what the highest performing business leaders do to sharpen their leadership skills, decision making abilities, and creativity. Excellent. So let's go. Let's get. Uh, let's get straight into it. Um, the highest performing leaders are ones who are always always working on improving, right? They're on, on working and uh, the ones who have this, you know, continuous improvement, continuous learning, that kind of uh, that kind of ethos. Absolutely. They're they're practicing uh, education. They're continually educating themselves both professionally and personally. Mm -hmm. And and it's not just in the topics that you might think. It's not just like how to be a better salesperson, for example. Yeah. yeah. So how do you think uh, how, how do you think uh, leadership skills, how do you think they have started to evolve as we're going through these rapid changes? I mean, for instance, like some people say we have five generations in the workplace. Somebody said six. I don't know. What, I mean, I believe anything at this stage. Or seems right. to be. Um, <laughs> but how, arbitrary. <laughs> yeah. How has that impacted? You know, it, it, there's so much change, so many generations. How has that impacted leadership skills? You know, I think it doesn't, it, it's almost not even just generational. It's just that people are raised so differently. Everybody has a different way of looking at the world. And so how do you communicate with somebody when you assume that the, everybody thinks the same way you do, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And so it's being aware that everybody comes from their own place. And how do you communicate clearly what um, what you're trying to communicate so that they understand it and and can follow whatever the instructions or you know they can understand your ideas. And so I don't know that it's so much generational as just being aware that everybody is different and everybody mm -hmm. operates in a different you know on a different um, I don't know different level, but just from a different um, from a different background. Yeah, 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 and and I think a part of that too is I mean the the big challenge today is once upon a time. Uh, whether it was effective or not, uh, you know, leaders de leaders tended to communicate in one way, right? You know, right. You put a message out, whatever. Everybody, you know, and everybody gets it. Now you can't. Yeah, you, you have to tape uh, tailor your message to different audiences because people receive information in so many different ways and have so mm -hmm. many different preferences. And I guess to just layer another issue on top of that. You may have a, a globally dispersed organization. Some of them may be in offices. Some of them may be remote. Some of them may be long-term contractors. Right, exactly. And so it really comes down to um, to leading, like becoming a person that people want to follow. And when I say follow, I don't necessarily mean I tell you what to do and you follow my mm. instructions. Yeah. But somebody who is inspiring, who is someone that people can respect and buy into the um the vision and then want to be on board want to be engaged in that kind of um in that mission yeah. so what are some of the things that leaders can do in order to get that level of engagement yeah one of the things um you were talking about what i had mentioned about what are the top performing business leaders doing what are they practicing and there are two concepts that they practice mm -hmm. that uh well maybe three concepts that they practice that a lot of people don't necessarily attribute to leadership because they think it's uh, it's too soft. And also it may be too easy, but we can get to that in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> the first one is, is meditation. Mm. And there are a lot of business leaders, people like, um, like Bill Ford, the chairman of Ford Motor Company and um, Richard Branson, and 
Ray Dalio. And I love using Ray Dalio because he is, if people who are listening don't know, Ray Dalio is like one of the OGs in yeah. on Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And Wall Street is about as far from woo-woo as you can get. And yet he has in many interviews talked about the importance of his meditation practice to his success. Mm. And the reason why it's so important is because it lets leaders or anyone on the team, I mean, I don't recommend it only for leaders. I recommend it sure. for everyone, uh, especially if you want to be successful in business. Look at what the most successful people in business are doing. And if they're using meditation as a way to calm and ground themselves, to make them a better able to make better decisions, to make them more creative and innovative, to make them uh, just more... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Emotionally uh, intelligent mm -hmm. so that they can have better relationships with their team and with their clients. All of these are just, this is just scratching the surface of the reasons why people practice meditation. Yeah. And, and what's really interesting about that is uh, obviously uh, the intentionality and deliberate nature of it, but also the fact that you know, they're doing something in order to set themselves up for their day, right? Uh, right. As opposed to, to say, you know, we live in this world where, you know, people just feel, unfortunately, like wake up in the morning, grab their phone, start looking on social media, start yeah. looking on new sites. And before you know it, their day is started, they're, they're frustrated or they're distracted or whatever. It's the complete opposite. Like their mind is a frenzy. It's the complete opposite of having a calm mind coming into your day. Exactly. That's exactly it. And what you just described is absolutely the worst way to start your day. It, yet most people do that. And it's just out of habit. And it's about developing a new habit. And we're not talking about, you know, people have this misconception around meditation that, oh, well, I don't have time because I don't have time to sit for an hour on a mm -hmm. mat cross-legged yeah. with um, no distractions and, you know, nothing going through my head. But studies have shown that even five minutes in at any time of the day, but especially in the morning, because you're, like you said, setting the intention for your day, five minutes, come mm. on. I mean, five, and that investing that five minutes is going to save you time down the, down the road throughout the rest of your day, because you're going to be more focused and more productive because you'll be able to get things done faster. Yeah. And, and I think part of that is you, if you can't do that, and uh, I mean, you have to ask yourself, why can't you yeah. Why can't you spend five minutes alone with your own thoughts? I mean, that's just, I just think everybody, that's a question everybody should ask themselves because, and, uh, and part of it is because we live in a world today that tries to prevent you from spending any time with yourself and, or your right. own thoughts. It just tries to distract you all the time and entertain you and all of this kind of stuff. Um, so I think it's a great, it's, it's a great point. And I think it's something that people should ask themselves. If you can't quiet your mind for five minutes, what's going on? Yeah, exactly. And do you want to be, all of those outside factors are programming your mind. Mm -hmm. So do you want to be in control of it or do you want them to be in control of it? No, absolutely. And then what are what are some other ways that uh, you know that uh, top leaders uh, you know what are what are other some other tactics that they use? Yeah, they practice another concept called gratitude. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and they express <laughs> gratitude in in many ways for their team, for their situation, no matter what is going on around them. And they, they actually express that gratitude and not just, Hey, John, thanks. Thanks mm -hmm. for being, you know, but specifically thanks John for your contribution today. That was really important because this, this, and this, like being right. very specific, you know, the thing is very few people get enough uh, acknowledgement for their value in the mm -hmm. world, in the workplace and in the world in general. And nobody is saying no more gratitude for me today. Thanks. I'll pull <laughs> up, right? They don't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, this is such a, this is such a profound point because it's, it's weird as humans, you know, we're hardwired to we're hardwired for the opposite, right? I mean, we're fantastic at catching people doing things wrong or not the way we think. We're great at, and um, we're really bad at catching people doing things right, right? Yeah, you know, we just yeah. breeze past it. Or, like you said, is is being is 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 going that extra mile and actually showing gratitude, but but putting it in context because just going, great job, patting the back. It's like, yeah, that's nice. Right. But it, it it's nice, but it's fleeting. But if you take the moment, as you said, to say, 
hey, listen, Laurie, that was a great job on what you did there. And, you know, blah, blah, really saved us. And here's how it's impacted. That's a whole different level and a whole different experience for you on the receiving end as me just saying, oh, well done. Yeah. Yeah. And there have been studies on uh, well meditation and gratitude, but there was a study done uh, by Harvard University and Wharton that showed that receiving a thank you from a supervisor boosted productivity by more than 50%. Mm -hmm. Yet people are less likely to show gratitude at work than anywhere else. Like mm -hmm. only 10% of people show gratitude at work. So why it's kind of crazy. Yeah. It's like a nice thing to do, but it actually boosts productivity. Wow. Why do you think that is though? I mean, without going off on a tangent, why do you think it is that people uh, in the workplace don't show, don't show gratitude? One of the biggest reasons I think is because they think it's uh, a weakness mm. and kindness is never a weakness. No, no. And, and I think that's the thing is sometimes people make that mistake, you know, confusing kindness for weakness and that, that normally doesn't work out well. <laughs> right, right, right. Or they think, well, they're already getting a paycheck. So why do I have to thank them? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's, 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 it's true. And it's, and, um, and I think, as you said, I mean, you, you, you know, we're all like human beings and feeling people mm -hmm. and that, and those moments like really live on with us in a way that, uh, so people, whoever's li people who are listening to this, I mean, you know, be number one, let's be authentic and genuine about it. But yeah. uh, as Laurie said, if you if you go around and you're you're generous with your gratitude, it'll come back to you in spades. Right. And it increases engagement when we're talking mm -hmm. about workplace and uh, engagement is a big topic these days of how can I get my my team to be more engaged and to mm -hmm. retain more people. This is one of the ways is by showing your appreciation for them. And I always think back to, it's so funny, you know, many, many years ago when I was in college and I was doing an internship, unpaid internship, because mm -hmm. communication majors, unpaid mm -hmm. internships. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And and the guy who ran the marketing communications agency I was working for, every day that I was there, before I left, he would say, Lori, thanks so much for your work today. You know, it really helped us do X, Y, Z. And in lieu of getting paid, it was, I'm still talking about it all these years later yeah, because yeah. it made such a big impression. And I felt good about doing the work for him because he was appreciative. Yeah. And there you go. I mean, there's a, a simple thing. I mean, you're, 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 you you were happy doing the work because you, you were shown the appreciation and it's such, it seems such a simple thing. Uh, but as you said, it's something that a lot of people overlook. Um, what are, what are some other ways uh, high performing leaders excel? One of the other ways is that they accept situations. And this is a really tough thing to do. Mm -hmm. it, we're not saying to be complacent. What I'm saying is when a situation, uh, you know, maybe isn't going your way and people tend to get frustrated and that's okay because we're human. Mm -hmm. But stopping and saying, okay, this is what the situation is. I can't change what has happened in the past. This is where we're starting from. This is where we are now. Now, how do I move forward? Mm -hmm. Instead of getting stuck in spinning of, well, you did this wrong and this is how this went wrong and, and all of the things, just be, okay, this is where we are. Now, how do we move forward? And that acceptance in any situation is so difficult for humans. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I was uh, used that Jack Welch quote, uh, it's face reality as it is, not as it was or how you would like it to be. Yeah. And and I agree with you. I think that is the toughest thing because um, oftentimes, you know, you, people get distracted, as you said, into doing an autopsy on why, you know, why we're in the situation we're in today instead of going, let's let's accept it, move forward. And then we can come back afterwards and figure that piece out. But right now, you know, let's let's just accept that we are where we are and we need to put one foot in front of the other. Right, right. That's not to say, right, what you said, like looking back and going, yeah. okay, where did things go wrong? So we can correct our process sure. so that it doesn't happen again. And at the same time, we're not saying, oh, well, this is what happened. Let's well, just like, but yeah. <laughs> moving from this place and, and then moving forward. And um, again, I was going to say from that place, when you accept where you are now, you can make better decisions mm -hmm. moving forward, which is another issue around, um, you know, when you're a leader, you have to be able to make better decisions. Yeah. And, and I think decision making is is really fascinating because it's something that, uh, you know, we're 
we're not that good at really is making decisions. We're not good at because, you know, we, we, we like options and then we get into this whole thing. Whereas, well, if I choose this, I'm unchoosing that. But if I yeah. choose and, and we can get ourselves kind of paralyzed in many ways. Right. Right. And so again, coming back to meditation, mm -hmm. when you are practicing meditation, your mind is calmer, even when you're outside of a meditation and it helps you focus better and it helps you make better decisions because you're coming from a place of groundedness instead of a place of, of chaos and, mm -hmm. um, you know, having all of those, uh, those options going, okay, well, should I do A? Should I do B? Should I, mm -hmm. you know, people turn into squirrels. <laughs> they like well, don't yeah, know which side of the road to go to. Exactly. So how did, the, how did the top leaders, how did they, how did they make their decisions? Uh, well, again, I think coming from the place of being calm and grounded, saying, okay, this is where we are now, where do we move forward and evaluating all of the options. And then I'm going to say this, and I know a lot of people are not going to necessarily agree with me, and I'm going to say it anyway, and I'm going to stand by it. Mm -hmm. They they use they they tap into their gut and go, I, this feels like. I mean, yes, they consider all of the the facts and the stats and all of that stuff, and then and again, meditation comes into play here because it's about getting in touch with your inner mm -hmm. voice and being able to hear and honor what is that inner voice telling you, and that's often the gut and the heart. And going with that, and sometimes it will not make sense to everybody around you, but if you truly feel that is the right way to go, then that is the right way to go. And, and there are a lot of leaders, I think, who do use this as a decision-making tool, but they're afraid to tell anybody that's how they do it. <laughs> no, I would agree with you. I think we've, uh, I think we underestimate, uh, you know, gut feeling or gut instinct. I, I think we've relegated it in some ways. Mm -hmm. Um, I, and and I'm not advocating for just going with your gut all the time. It's but it, it is it's a data point like other data points. And yeah. I think if you if you if you ignore it as a data point, you do so at your peril. Right. I mean, there's a reason that we have that term of going mm -hmm. with your gut. It's because there's so much uh, information. It's actually smarter than our brains, mm -hmm. our gut, and our hearts. Our hearts' um, elect electromagnetic field of the heart is 5,000 times greater than the brain. So the heart knows more and better than the brain, but we discount it and say, well, that doesn't make logical sense. And so mm -hmm. But how many times have you or anyone who's listening gone against their gut or their heart? Yeah, and and regretted it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No. And absolutely. So I guess one of the other parts of you know for high performing leaders is that you have to have that uh, you have to have that confidence, fortitude to maybe make a decision that other people are going. Well, I'm not. I'm not really understand this or. Or, well, that's not what the data is, is saying right now right. or whatever. I mean, you have to have that confidence and fortitude to go, okay, I'm, I'm going to go with my gut on this and I'm going to I'm going to stand by whatever happens. Yeah. And it's interesting. So, again, I always come back to the there's research and studies behind this because when you start talking about gratitude and meditation, some people mm -hmm. get a little squeamish because mm -hmm. it's kind of like maybe considered woo-woo still, but there's not. It, it's not. There's all these all this data behind it, um, that practicing gratitude actually increases confidence. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And so when you're talking about being able to have the confidence to make these decisions, again, when you are practicing gratitude, and, and that goes beyond just saying thank you to your team and acknowledging yeah. team and stuff like that, but it's also practicing gratitude throughout uh, the other parts of your life. And so like complaining and criticizing people. Mm -hmm. We, we love to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't, it doesn't help you in any way. No. It doesn't even feel good once you've done it and you're like, you're finished complaining. You don't feel good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really, it's, um, it's really fascinating. And I love that idea too. Like I said, I mean, you have to have that confidence and you said you know that can build your confidence and one of the ways i used to do it is i used to say sometimes when you know we make the final decision and it, it was on you know a lot of gut involved i would always say to other people listen if i'm wrong you can come back later and say i told you so yeah i said i'll be quite happy to accept that i was wrong <laughs> right but for now we're going <laughs> right and that's another point about being a leader is mm -hmm. that you have to um be willing to accept that responsibility yeah 
Yeah. And you have to be willing to lead. Right. Right. Um, yeah. And I think that sometimes, you know, you know, especially nowadays, I think some leaders get really kind of paralyzed about that actually leading because somebody has to eventually say move forward and you right. can you can get all these inputs and all these data. And we have access to so much today that you can literally um, you can literally make sure that you never move forward because mm -hmm. there's always another data point. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And um, and again, like that's where the meditation practice comes in and helping you feel confident, feel secure that this is the way to go. And all right, enough data. Yeah. Now we move. Now we move. Exactly. Well, listen, Laurie, this has been fantastic. Uh, all of Laurie's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about what you do. Yeah, so I work with business leaders and their teams to help them um, learn these tools and techniques that can help them be more focused, more productive, more uh, calm and grounded, and ultimate, ultimately more profitable. And the name of my company is Zen Rabbit. And yeah, you can find me on LinkedIn and all the socials or zenrabbit.com. Yeah, zenrabbit.com. Zenrabbit shouldn't be hard to find. So uh, listen, thanks again, Laurie. Thank you for watching and listening. And I will see you all again very soon. Yeah.